kick us off, Tom. Okay. Uh, call to order the uh, Compliance and Enforcement Advisory Subcommittee meeting. And I'll just go ahead and, and take roll. We've got uh, Tim Wessel, Ashley Reynolds, Present. Carrie, could you pronounce your last name so I stop butchering it? I, I can. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Jigger. Jigger. Yeah. Carrie Jigger is also present as well. And I believe uh, Ingrid will be joining us. Um, I think Mark, Mark Cohen is not here. Yes, Gina Kramer is here. Uh, and then from the board, uh, looks like we have Kyle Harris and Randy Hare. And then Kyle, anyone else in the room? Um, we've got uh, Lindsay Wells from the uh, Vermont Marijuana Registry. We've got Brandon King from the Division of Liquor and Lottery, and his colleague uh, Skyler is on the phone, calling in from overseas. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six members of the public. Great, and then I'm sorry, I also see that uh, I think Julie uh, Hubbard is also uh, on, on the on the okay. the meeting as well. Yeah, I can't see that. Okay. And Mark is now here. Okay, great. We got a packed room today. We got a couple more members of the public. It's gonna be a tight one. Thanks everybody. All right, Tom, well thank you, thanks everybody. I wanted to start today by just re, um, revisiting our, our seed to sale conversation. Brent and I put together some very basic sentences that are very top, top line overview um, of some direction that the subcommittee can give uh, the board and Bryn and, and um, attempting to um, work with a vendor, um, whether through an existing state contract or putting something out for a proposal um, that can just serve as a guide um, for what we're intending to to form a relationship with. Um, so Brandon's going to plug in her computer and share that screen. I'd ask um, both members of the subcommittee to look at those sentences. There, there's. I wouldn't anticipate there's a whole lot of questions because they're not very substantive. Um, to be honest, but hey, that, that's where we're at. Um, and then if, if there's no further questions, we're hoping that um, somebody might motion to vote on this language that the board can carry in conversations with, uh, with um, a number of different vendors that we would seek to work with um, so we can get the ball rolling on this program in anticipation of, of meeting deadlines in 2022. So I'll give everybody a moment to read, ask questions, Thanks, Scott. Inker Jonas is also in the call. Oh, great. I believe Inker Jonas is well. So again, very very broad, very basic, but I think it, it gets to um, some direction for us. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? This is Ingrid. I don't, that seems very reasonable to me. Great. Um, Brian, if you wouldn't mind pulling this back down, we can move to a vote. So, uh, um, as facilitator, I'll move um, for a vote on these sentences for seed to sale tracking. All in favor? Ingrid, Tom, Aye. Tim, Ashley? Aye. Aye. I don't think there's anybody to oppose. So the ayes have it. Thank you all. Another feather in the cap. Two meetings in a row. Take that. Okay. Um, we're moving a little bit ahead of schedule, which is. Fantastic. Um, I want to, actually, we're running a little bit. Oh, no, we're running ahead of schedule. That's great. All right, so I want to turn the conversation back to local control. I know that um, Tom and Mark um, did an overview of, of um, local control measures they found in other Dillon states that have a legalized market. Um, 
I don't know if it, and I, I'm hoping that folks had an opportunity to really look through those recommendations or those those model, excuse me, not recommendations, what other states have done over the course of the last couple days. Again, I'm recognizing this is supplemental to your day jobs. So um, Mark and Tom, maybe it might be prudent to just very 30,000 foot go over what you found. And then Tim, I'm, I'm hoping that you might help lead us through parts of this discussion. I know Julie um, is looking to hold a round table and we want to get some substance from the subcommittee to inform that round table with municipalities and the League of Cities and Towns. So um, how can how can this subcommittee facilitate some something um, to inform what, what they're going to be talking about? Sure, I, I, I can provide a, a summary of what the, the reference materials that were provided. Um, it's going to be the same summary that I provided the last meeting, but uh, we were looking at here, Dillon states, and, and there aren't that, that many, um, but it was basically Nevada and, and Virginia. Virginia just legalized recently uh, for adult use, and you know, cities like Richmond, they, they haven't developed yet uh, the local regulations. So what we disseminated were from towns like Reno uh, and Las Vegas that you've seen, obviously, larger um, larger cities than, than we're dealing with in the state. Uh, but it was to give you an overview. Um, and, you know, it, you, you can see kind of how comprehensive those were. The caveat is that Vermont the Vermont legislation, so Act 164, is is unlike uh, what you're dealing with in Nevada as far as the enumerated powers that are, are given to the, the towns and the cities in Vermont versus the legislation in Nevada um, and also in, in Virginia. So um, you, know, you have to take that, what you're seeing there, in context. And then what Mark had also found was from Connecticut and Virginia was some of the um, suggestions from their cannabis boards uh, about um, giving some direction as far as uh, local ordinances that they were going to disseminate um, in Connecticut and Virginia as well. Mark, did you have anything to, to add to that? No, the, uh, I wanted to say that the, if you take a, a look at the Virginia uh, law, <clears throat> You'll find some uh, things that they are the state is uh, giving over to the uh, local governments um, such as the uh, permission to levy a three percent tax on uh, on uh, sales of cannabis um, to uh, offer a special event uh, licenses and fees um, and uh, you know, they, uh, those, are, those are two things in the law. There were a series of recommendations that we found kind of useful by the uh, Virginia Joint Legislative Audit Review Commission that were recommendations just before, uh, just before the legislature passed uh, the cannabis bill. And it uh, basically it, it uh, was talking about authorizing uh, retail license caps by, by locality uh, and uh, uh, local authority, you know, they specified local authority over marijuana uh, operations. Uh, they wish to, since the General Assembly may wish to consider including any legislation authorizing commercial marijuana sales, um, an affirmation that local governments maintain their full powers to Require commercial operations to meet local zoning requirements and, and so forth. So these are not necessarily in the in the legend in the statute now, but these were uh, recommendations that may be worth looking at since you're you know you're considering uh, making recommendations to the legislature. And then Kyle, I also just wanted to, to add on top of that on Tim Wessel's recommendation, um, Mark and I did have a. Uh, a, a call with the cities and towns um, with, with Glenn and Sackoff and Karen Horn uh, just to get some of their perspective. Um, understandably, they, they were frustrated but, but recognized you know, what Act 164 does as far as leaving them with, with some limited authority. Uh, 
but you know it was a good conversation and they, they did share that you know I, I also want to give kind of a perspective on um, what cities and towns were what their capabilities were of you know as far as zoning um, and what bylaws already were in existence it sounds like they were saying maybe there, there were 10 or 11 um, different towns across the state that may have some um, kind of ordinances developed as, as far as zoning uh, but other than that they were really looking towards whatever we can provide as a model so that they have a, they have a heads up going forward but what what they did want to stress and I think what I've, I've also explained to the board as well was the, the timing of this is going to be uh, it, it's going to be severely challenging uh, just as far as even if we had something today uh, to give you know, as, a, as a model, um, it would take, and I'm sure Tim can expound on this, but it, it would take a while just for, for the towns and the cities to get hold of that and, and to adopt something um, going forward. And, you know, the fear is for the, the cannabis industry in general is that's typically where, where the bottleneck uh, occurs, and especially if we're kind of ramming down all sorts of the ordinance is up all at once and it's going to be kind of a process along along a timeline for this to, to work smoothly which which I certainly um, agreed with and they also put us in touch with with folks with the Department of Health and Safety because you know another one of the tasks is to you know we're, we're trying to develop all sorts of inspection building safety standards um, which don't necessarily exist in most of the towns it doesn't sound like but they do follow whatever the, the state regs are there from, from the fire ins inspection, so we can get, get hold of that as well after we talk to those folks. Thanks, Tom. Tim, I, I, wanna, I wanna kick it over to you if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. Uh, can you hear me all right? We can. Thanks, I have a couple of different mutes to have happen. Um, well, I mean, I, I thank you to Mark and Tom uh, Whoever else was involved for talking to VLCT because as I tried to point out at the last meeting, my experience tends to come from Brattleboro. Um, Brattleboro has a very specific population, um, which does represent a few towns in uh, our state, but um, not, you know, not indicative of the whole state, you know, of course. And so, so many towns in our state just rely on state regulations, state zoning rules, states, um, edicts to to come to, you know, what the rules are in their particular towns. Um, I just, I want to say that, like, the, the speed at which this is, is expected to happen is, as I think we all know on the committee, pretty, pretty quick. Uh, and so it's tough for anything to happen in a democratic fashion throughout the towns and then have it be, because we are a Dillon's rural state, it has to go back, literally has to go back to the state for approval when we change our ordinances here in in Brattleboro. I, and I want people to really understand that, that in Brattleboro, Vermont, a town of 12,000 people and a strong municipal government and 150 full-time equivalent um, employees we if we want to change a traffic light configuration or a parking sign or a stop sign it needs approval from the state that's still in school. so it's it's frustrating to town when things are pushed through so quickly that it has no hope of really getting a good democratic consideration from but as I started out saying, talking to VLCT is wonderful because they have a bigger picture. Karen and Gwen are the two main people. They have a bigger picture of what's happening throughout all towns in that's, that's their job, and um, they're good at it. And I wanted to just, since I wasn't asked a specific question, it was just kicked to me, just make sure that everybody understands that as far as on the taxes side, because we can kind of split it into taxes and fees, there was this unsuccessful push uh, last year um, that I was involved in 
to try to get the legislature to understand that a local tax portion would be the fairest way to go about doing this. Um, that did, was not successful. So I want to make it clear that only about a dozen, from my understanding, maybe 1516, because some towns are rapidly trying to adopt what's called a local option sales tax. That would give us not 1%, but two thirds of 1% of retail sales that are, we would we would tack on, in, here in Brattleboro, we've managed to do it after much consternation. We've tacked on 1% local option sales. So it's a statewide 6% tax on certain items. It's now 7% in Brattleboro. Uh, it is administered by the state as per their rules. And so we get two thirds of 1% of taxable items. It's proved to be a wise decision, in my opinion, for Brattleboro because it also includes places like Amazon and it includes online ordering, which, as you know, we did it right before the pandemic and boom, a lot of people order through those sites. So it was very wise to Brattleboro. It's helped. It goes into our general tax revenue and it's a huge help here in Brattleboro. So Brattleboro is slightly luckier than other towns in Vermont because we will get our two-thirds of one percent of the retail uh, sales. However, other towns who have not done that, and it is a lot of work to get it through to convince your residents that uh, one percent of option is a good idea, they didn't see marijuana coming. They, they certainly didn't see a pandemic coming, so they're not as lucky. Um, they will not be getting any direct taxation, however you want to call it, relief, support. I think I'd, I'd encourage this committee to call it. Um, so it, it falls to fees. And so what what will it be that the techniques are expected and able to charge when an application is made on the local level to sell campus? whatever capacity. Um, Tim, just, that's my little just, deal. Just to, just yeah. to follow up on that, I, I know no decisions have been made at the subcommittee level at the board, the, obviously at the board uh, committee level when it comes to fees, but I think the subcommittee was looking at it from, a, from the perspective of allowing towns to um, impose a fee on a, up to a max, maximum <laughs> dollar amount basis where the town could decide Know, what it thinks is necessary or prudent um, up to a certain threshold. You know, there's a couple different numbers kicked around in the in the subcommittee meeting, and I don't think it's wise that I necessarily repeat them here because they never really followed through on on a, a specific number. But that was the thinking that that, that subcommittee, from my understanding, was um, was moving in that direction. Okay. Thanks for the info. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Just. A note on the speed, it, it's just all moving so quickly that I, I literally haven't been able to schedule a meeting with the LCP to really understand their perspective on the multiple multiple towns. And, and as you know, we have a, a round table coming up next week. So. Yep. Carrie, I know I have a question. Yeah, Tim, this, this is for you, and it is primarily for discussion. I have <coughs> no opinion um, in this regard. I just heard some of the discussion in the legislature about when they were talking about the tax. There, were the, there was a discussion about excluding towns that opted out. Um, and I was wondering what your opinion was on that. So the discussion in the legislature, that I, the pieces of it that I heard um, I did have other bills that I was paying more attention to. But they talked about if a town opted in, they would have access to the additional tax. Uh, and if they opted out of retail sale, they would not. Um, it's not my understanding that the towns have been given any of tax. That's Correct. No I, no, I understand that. But I heard that as part of the push. Um, there was discussion, and I was just curious as to your thoughts <coughs> on if they opted in, 
it, it was sort of incentivizing the opt-in scenario with additional tax fees and I mean that's that's another whole cool question I didn't want to get into the rabbit hole of whether opt-in or opt-out is, is a really democratic way to go about doing that because that was a decision that was made that ultimately I, I'm not sure that's that train has already left the station in my opinion but um, I think it's important to understand that um, towns don't really feel like they have much control at the moment of what's what's moving forward. So. Thanks, Tim. Um, Julie, I know you're with us. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but if you're listening in a place where you might feel comfortable um, helping inform this committee what's going to be helpful for your round table, you know, don't hesitate to, to jump in. Tim, I would imagine that, that rough number from the market structure committee on that maximum fee, um, you know, number might be helpful for those discussions. I know that you know from a zoning perspective, you know, what traditionally can be looked at from a, a, a commercial product or a commercial presence in your town um, in that perspective. I, w I wanted to make sure that you were aware. I, I'm, fairly sure that 164 gives um, municipalities also authority to regulate odor and through from a nuisance perspective. Um, another interesting thing came up in our sustainability committee meeting yesterday. We were talking about um, energy standards that were given to us by the public service department. Um, and even myself with the environmental policy masters, I feel like I got a master's level class in electrical engineering. Um, I'm sure you probably feel the same listening to that conversation. But um, what came up was um, like the dark skies rule, which um, I think is what California refers to it as. And I know that um, you know it's something that's talked about in the context of Massachusetts, but if you're thinking about a, a, a greenhouse grow or an outdoor grow with lights, um, you know, cycling those, those lights at after hours, you know, 12 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, I'm wondering if, if a discussion are at the round table around what, I know that in the state of Vermont that's typically, the, those types of ordinances are typically done at the local level. I think it's harder to enforce those, um, is what I've heard, but it might be worth carrying that conversation to that round table as well. I mean, I have Carrie in the room and Dave in the room, if you have any thoughts or experiences with with that, you know, I know that the aesthetic value and, and lights and as, from a 250 context is also something that's considered when a product falls into the 250 jurisdiction, but um, something to think about and consider in addition to your traditional um, commercial um, zoning abilities as a municipality. I, I appreciate that. It, it, you know, it really comes down to capacity of towns and, and how we all, all of us who live in a Vermont town are familiar with property taxes, and, and if Brattleboro is going to have an increased uh, need to be thinking about odors and lighting at night and things like that, that require another staff member, right? So that's, that's building capacity, which falls into costs, and if the the sales doesn't support the cost to towns. It's essentially an unfunded, unfunded mandate, which we're used to, but it certainly is not a, a, a democratic and kind way to go for the citizens of Brown. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I respect the <coughs> perspective that you're coming from. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that those could be, like, or other than your traditional boxes that you check off of from a commercial zoning perspective, um, it might be wise to bring those to those, those other unique to potentially this industry um, requirements to, a, to your um, round table discussion. Um, you know, I, I know that we're moving fast, Tim, um, but we also don't have any real products or anything in writing to help facilitate your round table. Um, I'm just trying to think of other things that might be helpful if that's going to happen still next week. And I can follow up with Julie um, offline. Yeah, yeah, I mean, sort of her baby, but I, I, I'm very appreciative of her 
So no pride of ownership over that. Uh, um, I'm happy to share the responsibility. <laughs> um, and I guess really what some of what you've talked about already, Tim, is what should come up in the round table in terms of what are the costs. And I think that that was the question last week, and I can't remember if it was compliance and enforcement or market structure. Like what, what are the costs that towns are looking at or concerned about that we need to look at to, to inform this? Yeah, Tim, that, that's, thanks, Julie, for um, jogging my memory. I know that market structure subcommittee members wanted to know if that fee was going to be higher on that maximum scale. Um, they needed to see for what. So having that kind of punch list to bring back to that committee and this committee, I think, might help justify a higher fee if that's a direction that, that you know municipalities want to go in. I can certainly help get that together. All right. Based most conveniently for me on, on Brattleboro's, but um, then we'll try to do a quick survey using the round table next week. Great. Okay, I want to shift gears completely um, into a retail enforcement conversation. Last meeting, the subcommittee did did vote unanimous, unanimously to um, charge the board with, with looking towards an MOU um, with the Agency of Agriculture for Outdoor and Indoor Cultivation. Um, there's a lot of other links in that chain that need to be talked about from an enforcement perspective. We're, we have the pleasure of having Skyler and Brandon here from the, the, the Department of Liquor and Lottery to give us a presentation on how they typically look to enforce retail from a tobacco and liquor perspective. So I'm going to give it over to Skylar. Skylar, we've got about 20-ish minutes. If your presentation is running um, ahead of schedule, um, I know Dave and Carrie also do some retail enforcement through what they're doing at Agency Bag. I'd like to hear what you're doing. Um, we've got a couple different options the board should and could consider here, but um, we wanted to start with liquor and lottery. So Skylar, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Can you hear me okay? Yep. That's my audio. Okay, good. I appreciate your time, and, and I won't take the full 20 minutes. Uh, you know, I, I can speak passionately about what we do for hours, but I appreciate you all have a, a tight timeline and a very important mission, so I'll make the best use of my time before you today. Uh, hello, everyone. I've, I've met some of you. I haven't met all of you. Uh, my name is Skylar Janess. In the room uh, physically is Brandon King. I'm the director of the Office of Compliance and Enforcement for the Division of Liquor Control. Uh, Brandon is one of our field supervisors. Uh, skipping really quickly through, if I can remember how to navigate there. It's a little bit of my background. I've been in law enforcement for about a little over 16 years. I started work at UVM Police, came to the state in 2013. I'm uh, here to tell you today about how the Department of Liquor and Lottery handles retail uh, compliance and enforcement, which is the core mission of, of my uh, team. We have four offices at Liquor and Lottery, uh, particularly in the Division of Liquor Control, Office of Compliance and Enforcement, our division, the Office of Education, the Office of Licensing, and our retail arm. Uh, obviously, here to talk to you about how we go about and our operating philosophy around compliance and enforcement of the retail sale of alcohol and tobacco products. There's my team, quick picture of us. There's about 11 investigators working across the state, each cover a, dis a dispersed area of responsibility. Uh, really, off the, uh, you know, from the start, I want to let you all know we are uh, certified level three law enforcement officers, but that's one of a uh, couple hats that we wear. Uh, we are given law enforcement authority under Title VII, Section 561. It gives us a similar uh, authority as the Vermont State Police under Title, uh, Title 20. Uh, but again, like I mentioned, that's just one of the hats we wear, um, and frankly, it's, it's not the hat we wear the most. I would say we wear a regulatory enforcement hat more than anything else. But here's just a list of uh, several things we do. <clears throat> but the important thing is that um, we focus you know, on our core mission, uh, which is, again, protecting uh, public safety through safe use of uh, beverage, alcohol, and tobacco products in the state. We have a statutory uh, com uh, compulsion to enforce the rules of, and laws around Title VII, uh, which obviously the cannabis uh, laws fall into, um, which is uh, an interesting nexus uh, because I, fir I firmly believe that they're very different substances. You know, tobacco, cannabis, alcohol, all very different with its own unique challenges. Uh, my office goes about our operational philosophy in three core key programs. The first is our minor compliance program, and that's your 
probably may know us best for that, where we actually hire minors to enter establishments to attempt to purchase regulated substances under age. Uh, the second program we operate in is a regulatory inspection program, and thirdly is investigations, and that's often where we put on our, our criminal law enforcement hat when we engage in criminal investigative activity. I'm going to go through each one of these pro programs, uh, give a brief overview. The first are minoring. Uh, when I say compliance, I often mean minor compliance, uh, so you can those are synonymous. We engage in those on both tobacco and alcohol. Interestingly enough, tobacco is statutorily required by our, our office to conduct one, at least one minor compliance check at every tobacco license within the state of Vermont in the year. Uh, there is no statutory compulsion for alcohol, but we believe in the model, so we, uh, we apply it as well as we possibly can with resources that we have. We also engage in some contracted compliance work for the federal government, uh, for the FDA on the, on the tobacco side, and we've recently started an online compliance program for tobacco to address retail delivery of tobacco products into the state, which is prohibited. Uh, on, on the alcohol side, we, we test both on-premise establishments, which you can think of bars, restaurants, uh, as your prototypical on-premise. We also test off-premise convenience stores, grocery stores, uh, things of that nature. And we also test other outlets, uh, farmers markets, uh, manufacturing locations, things of that nature. Talk a little bit about tobacco compliance under Title Seven, Subsection 1007B. Again, it's, it's statutorily required that we do this work. Uh, it looks, it, it, it's, a, it's a fairly simple program. Uh, investigators recruit minors, they become temporary employees of the state. We train those minors uh, on uh, internal protocols, rules of engagement, if you will. Uh, two investigators will accompany a minor and will send them into establishment and ask them to purchase tobacco products. Uh, they, don't not, they do not lie, they're instructed they're not allowed to lie, they use their actual issued uh, state identification card. We really we build the program so that it is as, as easy as possible for our retail establishments to identify that this is a person who's a, it's a prohibited sale and that they should refuse the sale. Uh, we observe undercover the attempt. Uh, in the perfect world, we want to see a, a sale refusal and uh, we uh, uh, check the training of the clerk and we let them know that they passed a compliance check. Unfortunately, about 10% of the time, uh, the sale will be made to the miners. And then we take civil uh, enforcement action on the clerk for selling the product to the miner under Title VII. And we can, we do have a, a, schedule, a waiver schedule uh, of penalties for the establishment of that failed compliance check. Same thing on alcohol. The only difference is it's not statutorily required. Uh, the program looks almost identical. Uh, of note, I will say with our alcohol compliance program, uh, it was interestingly enough tested by the Vermont Supreme Court in the early 2000s uh, and uh, stood, stood the test that it was uh, constitutional and, and prohibit, or allowed, not prohibited under law. Uh, and I can share that, that case law with anyone who's interested. Uh, the second core pillar of our program is the inspection model. Uh, it can be as in-depth as a full-on business audit. Often it's as non-invasive as uh, us observing operations and ensuring that they're complying with all of the regulations and laws as established by either Title VII or the, the Board of Liquor and Lottery. Uh, you know, we have about 52 general regulations that we enforce uh, as imposed by the board. You know, uh, they're very simple, can be as simple as making sure that licenses are hung on the wall. The real key one, the one we focus on a lot, is our server and seller education to make sure that servers and sellers are trained. Statute requires that every two years, anyone engaging in the sale of beverage, alcohol, or tobacco products are trained either by our department or using certified uh, third-party trainers. Uh, and then obviously we look for um, observations for intoxicated patrons, youth, uh, youth around the establishment, or any and all criminal activity that could occur there. Uh, the third pillar that I mentioned was our, you know, our law enforcement officer had most of the time uh, follow-up investigations. We'll often get complaints from the public about criminal activity that occurs in and around our licensed establishments. Could be anything from gambling to human trafficking to uh, tax violation, tax fraud. Uh, and when we receive those complaints, we have a standing mandate within my, our division. We investigate all complaints that we receive. Uh, but we don't do it alone. We frequently partner with uh, partner agencies, either law enforcement or non. Uh, it's a big mission set. We've got around 7,000 licenses uh, active at any given day. Uh, so we do certainly use our support network to uh, complete those. Uh, this slide doesn't render very well, but I want to tell you really quickly about um, uh, the operational philosophy that we use. We 
make all of our decisions at the uh, Office of Compliance and Enforcement uh, based on data, a completely data-driven decision-making model. And we do that using some technology. So we have a program called Project Rabbit. It's an acronym, it stands for Resource Allocation Based on an Intelligence Toolkit. Uh, the problem statement, as you can see there, is I, I only have 11 field investigators covering the entire state with 7,000 outlets serving tobacco and alcohol in any given day. I, we need help to know where we need to be at the right time. Uh, before we had technology to help us with this, we were relying on gut instinct, uh, or at best, uh, or, or randomness at worst. So uh, this data was non-existent before we uh, fully embraced this paradigm. Uh, but once we brought Project Rabbit on, we built uh, an iOS mobile application that collects data in the field. Our investigators co collect very granular data about all of their activities. Then we use that collected data and we connect it to other uh, disparate data sets to help paint the pictures of where problem establishments are across the state. We connect to uh, health department data. They do a, a number of surveys uh, um, uh, that we use to help better uh, build our program, support the data that we collect. We collect DUI data, which is hugely important for us in terms of beverage alcohol abuse in certain areas of the state. Uh, so those two programs together become a toolkit for us and help us visualize that data. And I'm gonna skip uh, over here really quickly. Um, the program is, uh, is based on a, a science and public health approach. Uh, we use, uh, we partnered with a number of different researchers to help weight algorithms to, to again uh, predict uh, where we'd be the most effective across the state. We can look at Project Rabbit live. I don't think that's uh, super useful for you all today, but I'd like to leave as much questions as, uh, or much time for questions that you might have for me as possible. But if uh, need be, I can certainly should demo that program for you. Thank you, Skylar. I can't see everybody with the way that our system is set up here. So if you don't mind unsharing your screen, that would be great for me. Yes, absolutely. I want to open it up to um, NACB and, and, uh, and the subcommittee members. Any questions? Any questions for Skylar and Brandon? Skylar, I, I, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, I, I feel like I have a really good understanding of, of, of your processes and, and your methods. Uh, and I think this was on an earlier slide, and then again on that, that problem data slide. But if you could just give me uh, just another feel for how, how large is, is your department and then another feel for, for the market place that you're, you're dealing with. You, you had a slide there that was talking about kind of square footage that you're covering. Um, the, the two things that I was, I was interested in. Yeah, so that, that's statewide. That's just the square mileage of the state of Vermont. We made that statewide jurisdiction, so we covered the entire state. Um, so, uh, you know, market. Uh, fluctuates uh, drastically day to day to day. So the different licenses and permits that the, the board issues, uh, you know, the summer months can become very, very busy. For certain times of the winter months can become very, very busy. When you look at fleeting events, such as special events, festivals, uh, farmers markets, things of that nature. But a, a good figure is that we have around 7,000 outlets selling either alcohol or tobacco products in any given day. Very quickly, uh, oh. size of the department, uh, OCE, my team, uh, 11 field investigators, uh, two supervisors, I'm sorry, four supervisors, and, and a chief. Uh, that's the entire department size in terms of field work. Obviously, we have a number of partner divisions within Liquor and Lottery, our education division, our licensing division, and our retail operations. I think total, though, between Liquor and Lottery, I think we only have, and please don't quote me, somewhere around uh, 80 total employees uh, for, for the department. I have a question coming. Yeah, Ingrid first. Ingrid, go ahead. Just get on that. Thanks, good. Chief. That was helpful. Um, I think my question is similar to Tom's, but I'm trying to get a sense of like what a case, what your caseload is for like an annual caseload of an investigator. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, I'm the first one to say it's. It's a lot. Uh, so uh, let's take. Let's take a products individually. There's around 900 tobacco licenses in the state. So we have statutorily 900 tobacco compliance checks that we have to conduct within the year. 
Uh, alcohol, no statutory mandate, but we believe in the model, so we try and apply it as, as comprehensively as we can. We conduct those checks quarterly, and we have some requirements about how many checks get done quarterly. Uh, regulatory inspections, we have a standing uh, uh, work rule that we expect at least three inspections to be done weekly, and those are strategic inspections, so we use that uh, Power BI uh, model to tell, tell us where to go inspect. And then com uh, investigations, that, you know, that, that fluctuates very widely depending on public complaints, uh, you know, referrals from partner law enforcement agencies. Uh, so it's varied. Uh, you know, Brandon is a, is a fairly new supervisor with us. He came from the University of Vermont Police, interestingly also. Uh, I mean, he could speak uh, probably more specifically to what a day-to-day -day looks like. Any given day in a law, uh, liquor investigator's world is never the same. Uh, we're always triaging priorities and kind of um, juggling the needs that are the most uh, most stringent, but um, we, we always, at least since I've been here eight years, we've never not met our statutory obligation of tobacco compliance, um, and we believe that's really important. So, Skylar, I think if I can distill it distill it down, I think you, you gave me a figure last time we had a conversation that was about um, for every every inspector, they're, they're covering 60 to 70 different license holders. That, that's, yeah, that, that's our comfortable zone. I, I think some, you know, we're often way outside of it, depending. But that's that's where our, our span, our scope of control, our uh, control is the wrong word. Scope of responsibility is probably the most comfortable. Yeah, Carrie, I had a question. Yeah, uh, Tyler, hi, uh, Carrie, here with the agency of Ag, and we most of our penalties are civil. Um, we do have a ability to go criminal, um, not as direct as yours. And just wondering, I mean, in my tenure at the agency, uh, we've gone that criminal route twice. Um, wonder how often you guys go go use civil, and uh, and how often you use the criminal. Yeah, actually, I'll throw in another one that I may have neglected in my presentation. Uh, the board has uh, the authority to admi administer administrative penalties, so that's actually that, that's our primary method of enforcement is administrative penalties. <laughs> it's our, uh, ours too. Sorry, I stand corrected. Ours too. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Uh, that's about ninety percent of our enforcement uh, actions. Uh, so that could that's that's around. We issue around 300 administrative tickets a year. Uh, civil penalties go to the individual, um, and that, that varies depending on how many failures we have. Um, so those are clerks who, who will sell products to minors. And then criminal actions, um, you know, those aren't always directly related to sale and service of beverage, alcohol, or tobacco, because we have full criminal authority. Those could be anything from a DUI arrest in the parking lot uh, to a gambling charge for a nonprofit, which we do some regulation on. Uh, so. I'll give you a figure. We, we generally make around 14 to 20 uh, criminal arrests a year, but that's not always directly related to retail sale of beverage, alcohol, or tobacco. Yeah. No, thank you. Just curious. Ashley or Tim, any any questions for for Skyler? Um, I just had a couple. When it comes to the data collection, when did you guys start? doing data collection and then how often is that data analyzed yeah so we started in 2017 uh, right around March of 2017 and I, I would say that data that data is analyzed daily so that that model that we use project rabbit refreshes every three hours actually so we're constantly feeding it fresh information we're letting the, the, the algorithm dictate our particularly our inspection activity based on the data sets that it's connected to um, so it's a, it's a it's a very frequently updated and analyzed model. Tim, I think you're on mute. I'm, I'm, oh, oh, I oh, just, sorry. I just wanted to add one. I just wanted to add one more thing when we're thinking about adapting this to cannabis. Like you know, liquor is not and lottery is not startup, and this is. And so I'm just curious. I see a little bit of a disconnect between analyzing data which doesn't exist using a period of time to collect data and then yeah. figuring out how we're going to analyze that. So that's where I'm at, thinking like, obviously, tried and true, this, this is a program that's been working for a long time, but how are we going to use that as a jump here into cannabis? So um, maybe everyone, that's what we're thinking of as well, but that's a huge, huge question in my mind. 
Absolutely. What I would say is our strategic model didn't come online until 2018. We actually used the 2017 year as a control year, so we collected data for an entire year before we even started analyzing it and letting it drive decision making. So we really didn't want to have a good comprehensive data set to start with. Thank you. Just wanted to say thank you, Chief, for a very crisp and efficient presentation. And uh, it just reminds me of the old adage of trying to um, fly the plane while you're building it. So. That's so we do best here. Going on. Yeah. Ingrid? Just so I'm clear about the Rabbit program, is it strategic in that it directs your your assets, like it helps direct where your your time is best spent, and what are some of the factors that you think go into that algorithm? Yeah, so there, there's, a, there's around 17 individual data sets that go into the algorithm. Um, but there are some that are weighted much heavily than others, and we relied on that public health uh, research-based approach to help kind of weight those algorithms. So one that's huge for us, uh, the National Institutes of Health did a, a pretty well-cited study saying proximity to schools uh, is a huge predictive factor for negative outcomes in a community when there's a, a, a liquor license establishment in close proximity to a school. Um, so we really wanted to use that data. The problem with us is that we actually don't, we, we don't, we haven't collected proximity to schools since the 1980s in terms of liquor licensing. Uh, but believe it or not, uh, the Department of Health does a counter tools data survey yearly, and they actually collect that information. So we were able to we were able to connect to counter tools data through the through the Department of Health, correlated to our liquor license establishments, and then weight their. Um, uh, where they fall in the algorithm based on that proximity to school. Another one we rely on hugely is DUI data. Uh, through the Vermont Forensic Laboratory, we actually have real-time connection to the DMT data master data. So we get, uh, get real-time DUI arrest data. So we can see where their spikes or trends in DUI arresting in any one community. And then the liquor license establishments, uh, based on their location in that community, will get a little bit more attention from our investigators based on that data. Uh, I, you know, 17 data sets is a lot. We can we can wait through them all, uh, but it's, it, I can tell you that control year data. What we found was with our inspection model is we were the KPI that we used was violations per inspection. So about two out of every 100 inspections, we would find a violation. When we went to that strategic model starting in 2018, we jumped to 15 percent. Uh, so it it really showed uh, tremendous increasing in our effectiveness in the field by letting Again, not randomness or investigator comfortability drive our decision making, but letting data actually tell us where where we can help. And let me be really clear when I say this: just because the strategic model tells us where to go, it's not about uh, writing more tickets. Matter of fact, we actually have written less tickets in the year since we brought Project Rabbit on. The goal always is to identify problems before they get out of hand, work with the licensees, uh, and, and uh, hopefully cut significant issues off before they occur. We're the Office of Compliance and Enforcement for a reason. We want to get to compliance long before we ever have to get to enforcement. Skylar, I have a question or, or just maybe something to leave you and Brandon with to think about and we can pick it up again um, next week. You know, part of, the, part of what you guys do you know, through sting inspections or sending minors into establishments, I think you know, could make up a, a good chunk of what you would help us with. I also want to recognize, though, that the stores or the retail establishments, um, at least in the traditional retail dispensary context, look quite different than a lot of the alcohol stores or places that you buy alcohol or tobacco in the state of Vermont. Um, you know, every other state that has a, a regulated market does things a little differently from holding your license from the time you step foot in the place until you're, you you leave with whatever product, but there's a lot more control over who's coming in and out of these establishments, and that's something that we've got to tackle as a committee when it relates to security. So, from a resource perspective, how can you know just something for you guys to think about, but also something for us to think about as a committee? How can we right size how security is handled at a, a storefront retail establishment to make sure that you're not overly burdened from a from a resource perspective, but also ensuring that there's a good culture of, of compliance when it comes to a retail establishment and those that are looking to actually purchase a product. Yeah, no, that there, that, that's, uh, there's a myriad of, of issues there, uh, obviously. I, I think my perspective first, and, and having visited dispensaries in Colorado and some other states, um, I think really, uh, 
the best thing that you that, that the board could do in rules and regulations would be um, looking at potential education requirements for people engaged in the sale or working security at those establishments. Uh, I can tell you firsthand, having done this work for, for a long time, the uh, the quality of fake IDs out there um, is very scary. Uh, I've been a law enforcement officer for 16 years. I can tell you that you can put a real high quality fake you can put a real ID next to a high quality fake and, and I can't tell the difference without running them through a criminal law enforcement database. That doesn't mean it's an impossible task. There's some great training curriculum out there about how to read body, uh, body cues because a person who's using a real ID versus a person who's using a, a fraudulent ID are very, very different. Uh, so there's techniques and, and tactics you can use to you know, analyze the ID, but there's also techniques and tactics you can use to, to read, the, read the patron. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of issues around that, but I think really um, thinking about training requirements or, or certification even to a certain level for sellers and servers. I, I'm the first one to say that my office would be would, would be uh, engaged in an effort of futility if it wasn't for our education division. Uh, our education division is is, is really the the, the the VIP, the rock star of our department. Thanks, Skylar. Dave, I see your hand up, but before you put your hand up, um, not, I know we're, we're running out of time. I'm not expecting you and Carrie to give the kind of run the gamut of how you enforce from a retail perspective at the Agency of Agriculture. I'd love to continue this conversation on Monday, but feel free to ask your question for Skylar. And then we're going to move to public comment. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, uh, uh, Chief. Uh, much appreciated. I'm your counterpart over at Agency of Agriculture, so nice to meet you. Uh, I think internationally, if I, if I heard it correctly. Yes. Um, yeah. I've got a, a couple of questions for you. I'll make these as quick as possible. Um, it sounds from your presentation that you uh, are looking at the uh, site of sale uh, for a lot of uh, a lot of these. Uh, do you ever follow the product after it leaves the retail establishment? Uh, and if you do, does that change uh, your course of enforcement? Uh, do you mean, I just want to make sure I understand your, your question, follow the product as in, um, you know, interdict sales that have occurred, and, you know, not actually witness the sale, but like come across products sold uh, to help me understand a little better. Sure. More of a, a legal sale or perhaps uh, something that does occur legally, um, but then once outside the store, turns illegal. Uh, so true. when you have the product, because the product would be the, the part that would be the illegal asset here as opposed to the point of sale. So the sales happening legally, what happens yeah. in the parking lot is illegal. And you had mentioned that you can do a DUI uh, on site. Uh, what happens when the, hey, mister uh, scheme turns into a, hey, kid, here's your product? Yeah, we actually do engage, I apologize Mike, for my confusion. We do engage in that as much as we can. Obviously our focus, we're hyper-focused on our licensed establishments and the activity that occurs around those licensed areas. Uh, but we routinely engage in those types of things. Uh, it's been several years now, but we had a, uh, it made some national press. We had a, a heady topper uh, case uh, where we interdicted a sale of a large amount of heady topper in a parking lot. Uh, we had a case of, um, uh, we routinely do smuggling cases because believe it or not, uh, Vermont uh, still has smuggling laws on the books uh, with our neighbors, our tax-free neighbors uh, to the east. Uh, so we do engage in some uh, smuggling cases it, I wouldn't quantify it as a large percentage of our work, but particularly when we get complaints or we have a reason to investigate, we do engage in those investigations. Okay. All right. Very good. But on a complaint-based uh, system, you, you would go after that as well? Complaint or, you know, just if our investigators happen to either develop their own information or observe that occurring out in the field. Okay. Uh, and then uh, what are your statutory maximums per violation administratively? And do you have a statutory maximum per enforcement action? Uh, we do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the board can issue. It's recently changed, and, and I let me make, let me get back to you with the exact amount, but I think it's around seven thousand dollars per violation uh, okay. that that the, the board of liquor and lottery can impose. Okay. With a ceiling per action, as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We we have a uh, and I'm I'm less familiar with it because we the board has actually delegated a waiver penalty schedule to our our team. So when we observe. Uh, routine violations, we can issue an administrative ticket in the form of a waiver penalty. It's much, much smaller than the, the maximum. Uh, 
And then we have the discretion in the field. If it's an egregious offense or maybe a repeat offense, we can we can then uh, notice them for a hearing before the board where they'd be looking at the full penalty instead of the waiver penalty. So when it's in the field and you give a citation, uh, that would not be going through a penalty matrix. That would be a predetermined penalty based on the uh, uh, the back of the ticket, basically. Uh, That's right. Do you, Are you sure? Uh, sure. Much like a traffic ticket, do you have, or a theory inspection ticket in my world, uh, do you uh, have anything that would be like a, uh, a penalty matrix for any more egregious or severe offenses? We put we, if it's if it's if it's above the, what the officer feels comfortable issuing a waiver penalty for, we push it to the board for a full enforcement hearing. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing I have is um, uh, what administrative enforcement actions can you engage in once you reach that board level? Would it be automatic hearing, uh, citation in the field? or you don't feel comfortable, so go straight to a hearing. Are there any uh, in-between tools that you can utilize? Uh, well, we have, you know, I guess the, the stratum of uh, enforcement tools we have would be like a, a verbal warning, a written warning, a, a waiver penalty administrative ticket, uh, and then the next step would be a full uh, uh, notice to hear before the board. And that, board, that hearing before the board would be uh, they would be looking at either uh, fines for violation or the suspension or revocation of their license. Thank you, Chief. All right, thanks everybody. I think I think we had one public comment, but they decided to hold their comments for a for a future meeting. Um, and we're right. We we're going to slide right in um, at time. I'd love to continue the retail enforcement conversation um, next week. And um, Tim, if you can think about how we can be in uh, in a further help to the municipal roundtable over the weekend. I'd love to preserve some time to talk about that um, on Monday. And then I'd also like to start wandering into security and what that means both from a physical location perspective, cash management perspective, so on and so forth. So, so Tom, maybe you and I can connect ahead of that meeting or we can start finding ways to attack that um, in small bits um, over the course of the next couple meetings. If that sounds like a plan to you. Okay, just a logistics note, if you don't mind. Um, I am unable to make Monday's meeting because I have a regular job that pays money. Um, <laughs> but uh, I will prepare something uh, using some advice from DLCT and our own town manager and a couple of other uh, folks around the area. So I'll be able to uh, give you some, at least bullet points for your Monday meeting. Appreciate that and thank you. Uh, look forward thank to seeing everybody on, on Monday. If I could get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. Thank you, everybody.